This is the Hour of History podcast. Our world, anytime, any place. And now from the Hour of History studio in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, your Hour of History starts right now. Hello and welcome to Hour of History. Uh, we're your hosts, Stephen Bauman and Matthias Feeling. I hope you are all doing well out there. Spring is in the air. It's turning warm. We're drinking some great uh, Genesee. Water. Genesee? Water. Genesee? God, I can't pronounce it. What is it? Genesee. Genesee beer. It's delicious. Shout out to New York's oldest brewery. And it's fitting. So there's two reasons this Genesee beer was chosen for this episode. On the one hand, it is green, like the colors of Saudi Arabia. <laughs> and on the other hand, we wow. would be immediately I'm exiled impressed. from Saudi Arabia. That's true. We would, we would probably get like multiple lashings. Anyways, so the theme of today's episode is the current state of Gulf politics in Saudi Arabia and a certain figure you might have heard of. He now has become so iconic in the last few months. He has his own acronym. M-B-S. Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia and the de facto power behind the throne. Our thick boy from the Middle East. Is, is he that attractive, heavy man that I saw on 60 Minutes recently? <laughs> or on a magazine that was published by Forbes? Or what company published it? Like, the one that Trump bribed his way out. Yeah, onto. yeah. And then he also did a, a tour of Hollywood a few weeks ago. You realize... On, on Instagram, he was hanging out with Dwayne The Rock Johnson, all the big stars. Do Elon you sm- Musk. Do you, know? you smell what MBS is cooking? You, you realize reform. <laughs> He's cooking up some mad reform. <laughs> you realize we're both going to be persona non grata after this episode. In so- but wait, all non-Muslims are persona non grata. Uh, <laughs> okay, we need to dial it back. This okay. is not an anti-Islam thing. No, we're talking about a very specific strain of Islam that has sort of created tension in the Middle East. So let's go back. All the way back. How far back are we going to go? Um, well, we talk, we're talking about Wahhabism. Yeah. So Wahhabism is... Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm going to go back even further. You want to go back even further? Wahhabism is, is part of Islam. Well, so, uh, well, are we talking about Salafism or... No, what I'm just... We, gotta, we I, need to have a game plan here, Steve. Basically, what I want to say is that uh, the Arabian Peninsula mm. is where Islam yeah. happens. Yeah, so... Okay. Rewind. Go back. So Saudi Arabia obviously is a very important site because it is a major, major, major oil exporter. Um, it's one of the OPEC countries. The oil, um, was it the Organization of Petroleum Exporting, Exporting Com- 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 Countries? Um, so Saudi Arabia is important just because of economics, because of that. Also, though, more in the realm of, of religion and ideology, it's important because Saudi Arabia is the home of Mecca and Medina, which are the two most holy sites in Islam. Mecca is the site in which all good devout Muslims are supposed to do the Hajj, where you go visit Mecca, you go circle around the Kaaba, which is the most sacred site in Islam. It's supposed to be um, the, the home of Adam. It's the first sort of site of human settlement. All Muslims are supposed to pray in the direction of Mecca. And so these are areas that are under the control of Saudi Arabia, which means, right, that Whatever happens um, geopolitically with Saudi Arabia is also important for the course of Islam globally. And if the House of Saud calls themselves the custodians of Islam, but it's it's a quite a distance between the founding of Islam and the emergence of the Saud dynasty. Oh, so, it, <laughs> so a it's, long time, right? It's an enormous. Uh, so, so the custodians it, it gives it a sort of like we're temporarily here, which already you know that's something that we need to think. It's a little different than these divine monarchs who you know we're coming from God, the absolute monarchs yeah. in Europe. There was a direct connection, whereas this is like. We're taking care of this right now. We are we are the regents of the authority of Islam on earth or something. Like right. So Islam, it dates back to the 7th century in the Arabian Peninsula. The Saud dynasty is founded near Riyadh in the 1400s. Okay. <laughs> so, so there's a few hundred years gap. Yeah. It, it's this alliance between the Wahhabists, who uh, Matthias was introducing us to, and this uh, House of Saud happens around the middle of the 18th century. Yeah. And so there have been various Muslim empires throughout the Middle East and throughout the Arabian Peninsula for hundreds of years, right? Shifting, we don't want to go too many details about that, but so there's the Saud family. Um, the Saud family are a proud, sort of noble tribal group, kind of family clan. 
Wait, we gotta in, d- in let's let's the, define the that. I hear that word used a lot. The clan, only witch tribe. tribe. Yeah. Uh, okay, maybe tribe's the wrong word. But okay. They're 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 a powerful family. Um, but for a long time, the Arabian Peninsula, right? It's a desert. It's mountains. It's 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 uh, not it's not an agricultural hub by any means. So the Saud family was known for just sort of being a big sort of clan that like ran certain things. They were kind of nomadic. Um, they become important though under the British in like the late um, 19th well, century, early 20th century. They kind of ally with the British. The British give them power to kind of like run things, which leads right after World War II when America kind of takes over the, the British position of hegemony in the world. Um, America also allies with the Saud family and basically kind of green lights the Saud family to have permission to be in charge of this new country, Saudi Arabia. Ergo, why it's called Saudi, is because it's seen as being under the control of the Ibn Saud family. In fact, it goes back to 1945 when the U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt reaches an agreement with this family that you're going to give us oil and we're going <laughs> yeah. to we're yeah. going to make sure that yeah. no one conquers you. Yeah, basically it's like guys, keep 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 that sweet sweet petroleum flowing and we will protect you. Well, so why is that a problem? They were founding members of the United Nations, <laughs> Matthias. The United Nations. It sounds good. Well, so it sounds good. But we got to talk about that little thing we mentioned earlier, the W word, Wahhabism. Yeah. So Islam right, is not a monolithic religion. It's huge. There's over a billion people who practice it. And same with Christianity. You can't just say someone's Christian and sort of expect that to just be a catch-all term. So, right, within Christianity, right, we have all kinds of denominations and faiths and interpretations. The same applies to Islam. So Wahhabism is a very, what we might think of, hardline, kind of fundamentalist approach to Islam. It claims that it wants to restore the roots of Islam. It wants to go back to the way it was at the time it was founded under Muhammad and his first kind of companions. Sort of, um, maybe perhaps if I'm sort of reaching for like an analogy, sort of similar to the way that like fundamentalist evangelicals in the United States and their relationship to Christianity are that's sort of what Wahhabism is to Islam. Yeah, I don't know if I would... The, well, I get what you're trying to say. I don't know if I'd go with evangelicals as my choice, but the point is there's iconoclasm. So so the Wahhabis are anti-saint, anti-imagery, anti-statue. They don't like ornate mosques. But also a very hardline um, understanding of like the Quran and literal interpretations. It's There's not a lot of room for what we might think of as tolerance... Or for kind of, right, it's very much like either you follow the laws of the Quran or you don't, and you're going to get in trouble if you don't. If you were thinking back to our Syria episode when we talked about uh, how Assad was an Alawite, Alawites are not cool with Wahhab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, Well, 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 yeah, so because, so Wahhabism, again, is like a subset of Sunni Islam, which is totally separate from Shia Islam, so the definitions and differences can get very... uh, complicated very quick. Long story short though, this is important because Wahhabism is founded in the Arabian Peninsula in I believe the 1700s by like a Muslim kind of theologian um, named Ibn Wahhab, ergo its its name Wahhabism. And this becomes kind of the dominant form and practice of Islam in the Arabian Peninsula very quickly. And so when the Sauds or this you know family comes to power, They all practice Wahhabism, and so when they all get filthy, stinking rich because of oil within a few decades, right, where you have people who grew up maybe, like, hanging out in the desert and traveling around on camels and, like, not knowing what money is, and then by, like, their, like, 40s, and it's, like, the 1950s, and they have, like, billions of dollars, that's crazy. And so Wahhabism becomes very influential because you see these insanely rich people under the, uh, the Ibn Saud family, but also other insanely rich um, Saudis in general in the country, they start to, you know, donate to foundations and they start to open religious schools. And the type of Islam that they support is Wahhabism, which is the most hardline Islam out there or sort of branch of practice of Islam. So that becomes important coming into the modern era because the origins of Islamic radicalism and terrorism comes out of these more hardline interpretations of Islam, which are by and large funded by Saudi money. 
Yeah. So, well, first, there's, I mean, there's a lot of things there, but first, I want to. Sorry, that was like a I mic know. drop. <laughs> Boom. No, I got to, I got to get out of my head. I have Matthew McConaughey just saying, that's where the gold is. You know? <laughs> He's always in these movies just searching for gold. And I had a friend, I went, to, I did undergrad. Time is a flat. Time is a flat. <laughs> where the gold is. But anyway, I had a friend in Louisiana State University where I did my undergrad who used, he was a petroleum engineer major. And he was always to say, uh, it's black gold. It's just black like gold. It is. it is. And so this is why MBS, our, 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 our boy, Mohammed bin Salman, is important. Because over the last few decades, well, basically ever since its founding, I should say, Saudi Arabia has been able to get away with a lot of stuff because of its basically monopoly over oil and because of this kind of de facto alliance that was made between the United States at its founding of Saudi Arabia will give the West oil and in return the West will protect Saudi Arabia. For one example, slavery was abolished in Saudi Arabia in 1962. <laughs> yeah, a little a little late, just a little bit. On just, the global scale. Yeah, and also if you look by any sort of measure of oppressive governments, um, Saudi Arabia is up there um, because of its like sort of interpretation of Islam along Wahhab lines. Um, right, like women can't really go out in the public sphere. They can't hold jobs. Um, they have to be not just veiled, right? Their hair doesn't have, not just their hair has to be covered, but the, the full burqa basically covering your entire body, only your eyes are showing. They can't hold certain jobs. And for a long time, there were religious police who would call them out. Yeah, so they had religious police. Um, also, um, there's all kinds of very hardline laws about um, practice, right? So ergo, you can't drink, you can't gamble. There's all kinds of laws against what they call usury or interest. Well, that is unless, of course, you are one of King Saud's many children who can go to <laughs> London and yeah, drink. And yeah, 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 yeah. So, so within Saudi Arabia itself, um, there's a lot of repression, We, to put it mildly. Um, there's a lot of – they still practice caning or like um, whiplashing – they still execute by beheading, I believe, or hanging. They do that to a lot of people. <laughs> um, yeah. And so it's it's odd because in the Middle East, right, the United States is always talking about reform and creating these like nice democratic states. And yet one of our biggest allies, indeed our oldest and most extreme ally in the Middle East, is uh, an authoritarian monarchy that is incredibly repressive. There's a little bit of a tension there. Um, but it's more difficult because starting in the 90s and through to the 2000s anyone who really started to investigate these things started to notice that well where where is all this sort of islamic radicalism coming from like where are these people like al-qaeda coming from where are these like people that are willing to go blow themselves up where are they coming from what's motivating them and as you start to trace the money trail you start to see that a lot of these people are getting trained or going to schools religious schools they're by and large being funded by big Saudi money or, you know, they are listening to recordings by certain Saudi clerics or certain Saudi theologians. And so a lot of people start to say, wait a second, what role do sort of Saudi citizens who have lots of money and who are sort of ardent Wahhabists, what role do they have in spreading Islamic radicalism across the world? But Matthias, I'm getting so depressed. I can't believe you're telling me our dear America would would – in exchange for oil would fund sort of people who are going to become radical or, terrorists or turn a blind eye to people that are funding uh it's it's absolutely extraordinary i mean and these so i said the agreement was made in 1945 between fdr and and you know king saud but we go on and like you know there's murders within the monarchy uh in, there's in, it's straight up game of thrones in, <laughs> not, it is it is and some hopefully someday netflix will bring it to us in more digestible form but in 1979, there the there are people protesting the Souths. They take the Grand Mosque in Mecca, yeah. and and you know what happens to them? They all get beheaded. Yeah, it's um yeah, there's it's what did it's we bad. do to that? No, Carter was busy. Something was <laughs> happening in Iraq. Well, Iran. well, so there's been all kinds of internal conflict within the Saud family. Lots of other Saudis have gotten inc incredibly rich off the oil through investment. This also brings us to a figure you might have heard of, a guy by the name of Osama bin Laden. He's originally Saudi in origin. Um, his father was from Yemen, who moved to Saudi or Saudi Arabia and was first founded. But his father became one of like the most wealthy like building contractors in the world um, by founding this business that just 
through oil money built like all of the building like literally built these cities that we now think of as the big major gulf cities that are like famous for being like you know like playgrounds for the rich those were all built almost literally overnight through oil money Mm -hmm. and so this is also like we wonder like how has bin laden able to be so active for so long it's because well bin laden was part of his father's like business but you know building stuff in saudi arabia right so like the oil money trickles down to lots of lower level people so so the saud family directly they're all billionaires but there's plenty of like millionaires um that are not connected with the saudi family but i okay i just want to push back a little bit though because this sounds all bad but at the same time iran was falling apart it, uh in that, yeah, yeah saddam hussein was using god knows what chemical weapons against the but Iranians. we were also giving money to saddam and <laughs> iran <laughs> i don't know matthias it seems like you have a lot of bad guys here i'm trying to make a good guy well um, i i uh, you can maybe find not so bad guys but i don't know if there's any good guys well, uh, and we also do. I mean, we we do have to get to MBS, which was our promise. Yeah. So let's oh, ke- let's keep marching. Okay. On. Okay. So so there is like it, the founding king, right? Ibn Saud himself. Yeah. He dies eventually. Ibn just means son of. Son of. Yeah. So so, but Ibn Saud is sort of like when you say that in Saudi Arabia, you mean the father of the nation. This guy's the important. King. But so there's been multiple kings since his death. They've all been so far one of the many sons of Ibn Saud because Ibn Saud had multiple wives because according to... I think to, he bragged about it. He had like 80 or oh, something. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, and according to certain interpretations of Islam, polygamy is fine. And so he also had just like a stupid amount of children. We're talking like dozens of kids. And then they... Stupid all, in terms of, of global sorry, environmental... Sorry, 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 sorry. I don't mean... Yeah, I mean just like a crazy amount. No, and, environmental reasons. Oh, yeah, yeah. I guess so. And then, um, <laughs> and, then, uh, and then all of them have multiple wives and have multiple children... So the Saud family and its sort of derivations is it, it's it's huge, hundreds of them, and they're all directly connected as family members. So this means, right, as we were talking about Game of Thrones style, there's a lot of conflict within like all of these people because they all are technically part of the royal family, but the pickings are getting slimmer and slimmer. But they still have access to money, and we shouldn't be just unfair to the United States. Uh, Britain has loved to partner up with Saudi Arabia. Prime Minister Thatcher, in fact, you know, made it a cool eighty billion dollar deal in nineteen eighty five to send them some cool fighter uh, jets. Well, and that's also something we've done for a long time is selling billions of dollars worth of weapons to Saudi Arabia, as because they're like tit for tat, quid pro, quid pro quo type of thing. But I don't, I mean, I don't want to get too far afield. This tends to be a problem I have. But uh, we should also mention that we do this with Israel as well. We do it with a lot of places. <laughs> yeah, Israel and Saudi Arabia, yeah. and hopefully we can revisit this when we t- get to MBS. But uh, they don't have the best of relationships, no. <laughs> to say the <laughs> least. To say the least, yeah. Well, so there's always been tension in just like the wackiness of American foreign policy in the Middle East, right? It, it doesn't really make much sense a lot of the time. Where it's come to now is... Right, we invade Iraq in 2003, and we do it under the pretense of talking about we wanted to establish a functioning democracy. That obviously led lots of people to start looking at Saudi Arabia and say, like, well, what the heck, you know? Like, why are we doing all these policies in other countries in the Middle East to create, quote-unquote, democratic states, and yet one of our biggest allies is this, like, is this horrible, like, right. monarchy? And so this has led a lot of people within, like, the American foreign policy establishment to start pushing, like, how can we reform Saudi Arabia? How can we make Saudi Arabia a nice democrat, or, like, a, a less nasty country, right? Like, what can we do? To, to be fair, Matthias, in, in 2000, uh, and this is the area, I, I work a lot with NGOs, Amnesty International said Saudi Arabia's treatment of women was untenable. Yeah, like, well, yeah, like, which literally means, <laughs> like, harsh you, words you, from Amnesty like, International. Like, like, you can't continue to do this to women and, and continue But this is in the country. year 2000. It's kind of extraordinary. Women, are, you know, start voting in Western nations uh, in, you know, the early 20th century. In, in New Zealand, they're voting in the 19th yeah, century. It's, at, it's extraordinary to me. And guess what? Women just got the right to drive in Saudi Arabia. So, okay, so this is an interesting thing. So, so we're, we're going to watch... <laughs> Don't judge, Steve. So we start progress get- <laughs> is being made. So we start getting into this discussion of progress and changes and liberalization. And I remember the Saudi diplomat standing in front of the United Nations and saying, "The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia announces women now have the right to drive." 
And this is like, the, what is this? This is in 2014? The bar, well, yeah. The bar is low. So we'll say that like the bar in Saudi Arabia for any kind of reform is very low. But after right the, the invasion of Iraq, you started to see kind of this like clanging of the drums of like, well, we need to see something change in Saudi Arabia because this just looks bad for America. Like like too many people in America are starting to like notice our relationship with Saudi Arabia and recognize that this sucks. Yeah. So this has led to this kind of like, I guess, like craving for a so-called reformer in Saudi Arabia. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold. Mohammed bin Salman. He has come upon us. So, starting in about, like, the last, like, five, six years, you started to come to see in prominence in the kingdom Mohammed bin Salman. So, Mohammed bin Salman is the son of one of the many sons of Ibn Saud. So, the current king is, I also believe... Salman? Salman. King Salman is, is currently the king. Um, and Mohammed bin Salman is, is one of his many sons. Um, I think Mohammed bin Salman, through some Game of thrones s backstabbing... Um, got didn't get didn't kill but like moved out of succession one of his elder brothers I think mm-hmm. who was in line to be the crown prince so this means that Mohammed bin Salman is now officially the crown prince ergo he's next in line for the throne right and and basically at this point he's like the guy in charge in the kingdom because his father is getting old and kind of decrepit and so that's cool which is cool so so we can probably bet that MBS or Mohammed bin Salman is going to be the next king in a few years. But so MBS got very quickly praised by Americans as like this is our boy. Well, we like he's going to be like our reformer. Young people. Well, he's thirty two, so he's pretty young. Um, he's very westernized in terms of like he knows his pop culture. You know, all the young Saudis have been raised on American pop culture, um, and he's this guy who's like, hey, women should be able to drive, and maybe corruption isn't that bad. And so he knew the rhetoric to kind of say to people. So something. No, but he's anti-corruption. Well, well, what happened last November, Steve, he, in Saudi Arabia? But, can you can you tell us what happened? It was something at the Ritz Hotel, I believe. But but he said that he was anti-corruption. And first, we should preface this. Uh, I, I'll let you give the story, but we should preface this with the Ritz Hotel is sort of also like saudi house prison so if you're a very prince you're if you're a prince who goes to london and plays with your football club and you accidentally kill someone or accidentally you know get in trouble with british law or american law then a lot of times you get extradited to saudi arabia where they find you not guilty and then you get to go live out your life in the ritz so what happened in the ritz well so this happened pretty suddenly so basically in a very kind of overnight process um the Saudi police rounded up. We're talking the creme de la creme of Saudi society, like multiple members of the Saud family, many of the leading lights of the government. Right, We're talking about the elites of the government, the elites of the society, the richest, the greatest, blah, 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 blah. They all got rounded up <laughs> basically overnight and brought to a Ritz hotel in Riyadh, I think. Mm-hmm. That's the thing. And basically what happened is they were kind of given this ultimatum of, Either you give up all of your assets and control to Mohammed bin Salman, or things are going to go badly for you. We don't have a lot of information, obviously, because the Saudi government has um, lots of incentive to not let the international community know what happened. What's gotten out is basically lots of these people were tortured. One of these, one of the members of the who, where this happened to got killed. We know that at least one person was killed, so we can assume that lots of other people were tortured. But basically, lots of people were tortured, their arms were twisted, and it was seen as kind of almost a coup, essentially, where MBS basically said, I am now the person in charge, and I'm not going to govern the way other members of of my family have before. I'm centralizing power, and either you support me 100%, or I'm basically going to kill you or like take all of your money. And so it was a deep, like, so it was a huge centralization of power. I mean, he became probably incredibly. He's already a billionaire, but like, who knows how much. But, but money he started he has challenging the religious police, and he let women drive. So who cares if he made a coup? Yeah. If he's helping westernize. Well, I think on the one hand, and then of course he's gone on this like public relation blitz of like doing what. If you got it, flying. Yeah, yeah, he's doing some reforms. You know, there's like what WrestleMania is going on right now. Well, WrestleMania Saudi? is going on, but the women are not going. Yeah. yeah. 
Because you've seen the women in WrestleMania, I trust. Yes, they they are not not Saudi approved. They, they do not fit <laughs> Wahab unless we're standards. in London. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so B- MBS. This happened last November. This kind of like basically this like internal coup of of the leading lights of Saudi society and the family. Um, he's like been making connections with kind of the rich and powerful internationally making connections with the U.S. government, particularly under Trump and Jared Kushner, he's been buddying up with. He did a big kind of tour of America about a month ago. He went out to Hollywood. He met, like, as I said earlier, The Rock and Elon Musk and a few other folks. Why would and, why would President Trump like a sexy, young, rich oil baron? I mean, who wouldn't, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, and so MBS is, like, playing this, uh, this kind of gambit of centralizing power, and also trying to do these limited reforms. And everyone is like, in America, it seems, has been really like taken with him of like, oh my God, this is the right. Because I said, everyone was like claiming we need a reformer. And now it's like, this is our boy. Yeah. This is our reformer. He's going to change the game. Except the bodega owners in New York City. You know why? Because the guys who run the bodegas in New York City are almost all from Yemen. And uh, Yemen uh, is in Yemen is fake news, Steve. Disaster. What country are you talking about? So in the meanwhile, there's while, other countries in the Arabian Peninsula. Go figure. Yeah, MBS is going on his tour. You know, looking like a rock star. Time magazine putting him on the cover. All oh, this is big. But meanwhile, in Yemen, a civil war that has been going on for a very long time continues to go on, um, which is kind of what they want. And it's being aided and abetted because the United States is sending money and weapons to Saudi Arabia. And then MBS has radically escalated the war in Yemen, which is killing thousands of people in Yemen. And it's also led to a massive famine and a cholera outbreak in Yemen. A cholera outbreak that has is unmatched in the 20th century. Which we're so we're talking like colonial British Poor, India. Like, like Yemen, Yemen is kind of a hellscape at this point. Absolute hellscape. Largely due to American support of Saudi Arabia and also largely due to MBS's policies. And the news, everyone's so bored with it, it's not even going to make the news. And this, to me, is, this is where I'll get on my uh, high horse. This is the real crime. Is so, like, you know, North Korea and Kim Jong-un will be on the news throughout the, for today until something else happens. But, you know, Yemen until has Until Kanye been, tweets again. <laughs> yeah, until Kanye tweets again. Good God. If someone retweets Kanye... Kanye, I'm calling it now, ladies and gentlemen. Kanye is going to be doing a concert in Riyadh within the year. No, it's true. It makes sense. It, but And I also want to bring attention to sort of the, the big change between the Obama administration and the Trump administration. So Obama was, was not doing the sword dance with uh, Saudi kings no. like <laughs> Trump was, oh, um, which is very interesting because so you see this Trump presidency and immediately they're like, Saudi Arabia is the rock in the Middle East that we are going to build peace on. Which, is, Obama did the exact opposite. Yeah, and went for Iran. And I also not to get too scattered. Which is here, one of the things I support Obama on. I know you yeah. you love to bring your Obama support here. But <laughs> one thing I want to on occasion highlight also is is sort of the fake news uh, hacking that Saudi Arabia has also sort of um, in a lot of ways borrowed from Russia. Uh, so one thing they did was they got in Qatar, Qatar we know for their famous, you know, I'm not pronouncing it right, but whatever. We say Qatar in America. <laughs> Qatar. Um, anyway, Al Jazeera is their news source. And Al Jazeera was big in the world and it was starting to make more and more of an impact until the this fake news reel scrolled across the bottom and it just explained that Qatar was sort of supporting these, these rogue regimes. Um, and it led to a blockade on uh, Qatar. So, so this fake news that Saudi Arabian agents have, uh, you know, sort of created led to this this blockade on Qatar, a nation that the West is fairly friendly with. So the Saudis start attacking Qatar, and basically, you know, it is a persona non grata in the Middle East, and then they just they're they're sort of turning their influence, and this is where people start to talk about the new Cold War that's emerging in the Middle East, and America is becoming a big player. We are. Well, we've always been a big player there. I mean, um, but especially 
It's yeah. one sided. We're not yeah. playing all the sides. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, we're not doing like the Kissinger esque. Like, right. We wish everyone could lose. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Well, I think what's. Well, I think what Saudi Arabia is doing and what like the leadership is doing is they're starting to take notice of wait a second, we don't just have to hang out in our nice mansions in, in in our country and we don't just have to go party out in Europe. We can actually, with our money, start throwing our weight around internationally. Right? Right. We don't just have to like kind of hunker down on our oil money and just have a party. We can actually like really start affecting real change towards what we want to see happen. And so, yeah, I think MBS, people like that, have taken a page out of, I think, the Putin playbook. Yeah. Of saying, well, we can just use our money to do whatever the hell we want and make people love us um, as long as we control the media. And then we can do that to, like, crush these little countries that have been annoying the hell out of us. But what's so kind of crazy is so MBS's plan is called, like, this Vision 2030 because they have the money to play the Putin game right now. But they don't even have enough money to go as long as Putin did because the price of oil continues to fall and they don't have anything else. Yeah. And I guess this is where I almost see the rise of MBS as a kind of like act of desperation on the part of the Saudi leadership or maybe even of MBS himself is we all know that oil and, you know, fossil fuels in general, right, are the leading factor in climate change. And we all know that that is going to bite us soon right like all the projections are talking about you know the climate is gonna be just screwed in a few decades but you told we, me it doesn't matter cynthia nixon can yeah. still fix the hey subway. hey hey man small change small <laughs> change little baby steps short of full-scale communist revolution across the world okay um but so i think mbs and the saudi folks realize that our main the only thing we have is our oil Without our oil, they have nothing, right? Without oil, Saudi Arabia has nothing. They have no other natural resources. Well, there's the custodians of Islam. They're trying yeah, to turn that yeah. into a tourist yeah, industry. Yeah, exactly. But they don't have any natural resource, I should say. So the problem they're realizing is if climate gets crazy, also the Middle East is going to like be burnt to a crisp. Like It's going to be almost uninhabitably hot. It is. Um, You're describing Saudi Arabia right, right now. Right now, it's going to get worse. But also, I think they're recognizing that if the West moves towards renewable energy, which I hope to God, and it seems will just sort of inevitably happen given survival. Are you, are you talking about the clean coal that Trump mentioned? Okay. <laughs> Regard, regardless of our, our beautiful an impressive president and his his coal that we like scrub we lovingly scrub after you take coal. you take it out of the ground you get like an old grandma with a nice like mitten and she like takes like a nice like scrubbing device like a little this is what, this is what Donald is envisioning you know you scrub it so hard it All becomes right. nice so and that's white. not gonna work but that anyway is. okay okay so if we move towards renewable energy I think they're all realizing and MBS is realizing that they're gonna just they're gonna be screwed right their, their money is gonna plummet So what do you do if you recognize that you have like a timeline of a couple decades to try and like maintain your world power? Host the World Cup. You, well, you do cultural (laughs) soft, you do soft power politics like MBS where it's like we need to make our, we need to actually create real financial institutions, right? Which is like the Saudis, right? They're trying to make like, you know, what is it, Riyadh and, and all that and the Gulf states become like the big financial hubs. Not only that, but there's adventure tourism. Yeah. One of my favorite heroes, Levinson Wood, British explorer extraordinaire, uh, recently did a series with Channel 4 in Britain uh, traveling in the Middle East where he reenacts Lawrence of Arabia and he wears this beautiful scarf and he has the curly hair and the beard. It's fantastic. I wish I could be Levinson. But so, yeah, so, or, or tourism... Or making these big Gulf cities like um, playground cities, like the like the Las Vegases or the Disneylands, with the death penalty of uh, of, of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, Surely it's not for the or, tourists. Or, or hosting WrestleMania without or, like, women. Without women, or like um, you know, getting buddy buddy with big like Hollywood stars who can endorse you. Things like that. So I can see why MBS is doing what he's doing. However. That's incredibly dangerous because, going back to what we said earlier, there's a bunch of people who really buy into Wahhabism in Saudi Arabia. And they don't really take too kindly to MBS going around and playing buddy-buddy with Dwayne The Rock Johnson and having WrestleMania 
and oh I don't know taking some of their relatives or patrons and putting them in a hotel and torturing them well okay torture aside can't we just turn Saudi Arabia into like I mean can't they just turn Saudi Arabia into a giant solar panel and power the world through solar energy no why not why not put one of those those things you see on the roofs put a giant one in the desert and then we can have uh, they could power at least Riyadh with that because they all want the money off the oil. and No, but in going forth in the future, you don't think that his 2030 plan has calculated, like, their best resource is the sun. And I mean, that could work. That could work. I don't... Also, and on the other side of these radical Wahhabists, they exist, for sure, to be sure. But at the same time, if anyone's seen the movie Wadija... You get me right now. If you haven't seen Wadija, go see Wadija. She's this radical little girl from Saudi Arabia who just wants to ride a bike. And the guy at the shop's like, nah, girls don't ride bikes here. But do you know what she does? She saves up and she buys a bike and she's like, I'm going to ride this bike. Is this a Saudi movie? Yeah. Made by a woman. I think she, I think it was made by a woman, is and it, I think she it, was in exile. Is it banned? Yeah, I was, like, <laughs> was going to say, I was like, is it banned in the no, country? No, I don't think so. What I'm saying is, so while there are the Wahhabists, there's also people who are changing and who are very receptive to this and who see MBS as but, someone who opens the door just enough so they can get or, their foot in and change it. Or, and this is where I will take my political stance or maybe mbs is just going to be a new dictatorial figure with a nice face with a nice western mask well in the meantime right he's just centralizing power taking money from everybody else and doing policies that are pissing off everyone in the country and that are setting him up to be in a very fragile position and allying and putting all of his chips in with the u.s setting him up for an inevitable fall because I see MBS as a figure very much like our good friend Reza Shah in Iran of I'm a nice enlightened reformer I'm great with the West but yeah. everyone, everyone talks about how cool the 60s were in Iran yeah everyone yeah uh, that might be a little uh, exaggerated no I see these pictures what? on Reddit what? they come up all oh, over the time oh god <laughs> yeah it's like Oh, I hate those memes. You're, You're not gonna believe Tehran oh. in 1960. God, those are that is internet cancer. These like stupid memes about the Middle East where they're like women in 1965 versus women in 2010. Afghanistan was uh, dope. Uh, yeah, it's like Afghanistan. <laughs> yeah. was so it was so chill, and it's like it was like California, <laughs> and I, it's just like. No, man, that's not, that's, this that's, is demonstrably false. That's not the case. Is this part of the Western sort of paralysis where, like, we have to imagine this, this like, this? we have to imagine MBS as being, like, a Kennedy or something? Because I think that's the we only do. thing we know. I think, I think we do. And I think we just have a really hard time dealing with the fact that these, that there's never been a kind of democracy in the Middle East. And that to think that there's, I feel like wait, whoa, Israel, Iran, oh. oh. Anyways, okay, sorry, being polemical, but like, I mean, like, I th I saw this a lot. I mean, I we all grew up like during the Bush era and the invasion of the Iraq War. Not all listeners. Well, I, you and I did. Okay, but I remember there was like this weird assumption that I saw on the news and on the TV all the time by the pundits, the, the you know, the VIPs who were claiming about how the war was going to be great and perfect. And there's always this like implicit assumption that like democracy is the kind of like baseline state of humans. And the real problem is you just need to get rid of things that are preventing people from exercising their natural state of democracy. So, of course, then if you think that, you're just like, well, all we need to do is get rid of Saddam and it'll be perfect, right? Or, like, all you have to do in Saudi Arabia is just, like, open up some reforms and, and, and it'll be great, right? And it just doesn't account for, like, human complexity, right? It's a very simple-minded view of human nature. And I really think that we're just sort of making MBS out to be this like reformer figure when I just see him as a very savvy dictator. And I just want to be clear though, when you say we're like this is almost entirely exclusively the news media. Okay, that's true. I've never heard a professor be like, yo, you're gonna 
freak when you hear what MBS is doing. But the problem is that the news media was well, like we're kind of biased because I guess I don't want to toot our own horn, but like we read a lot of books and we we're, we like pay attention to the news a lot and we're like that this is that's our shtick. That's what we do for a living. Right. Whereas I don't want to be mean, but like most people have like other more important things they're doing, right? They have like their job. Yeah. They have their families, they're busy. And so even moderately people who try to be moderately informed they're just going to like read the New York Times or WaPost or any other kind of, you know, in an ideal world, right? If they're not reading like the Daily Caller or something, right? But they're like reading, you know, just like the news media. They're reading those people. And that's why you have to pay attention to what the news is saying. Because even though maybe you and I are like, oh, rah, 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 right, whatever, right, we know better. But like, it's like most people, that's where they're getting their understanding of these events. So if the New York Times comes out and says MBS is, is the man, Millions of Americans are going to be like, MBS is the man. And I think this is a very important point, and this is why you're listening to Hour of History, because... Life hacking. No, Life because hacking. We, we read some of these news articles, and it's just so simplistic. Like and, Thomas Friedman, man. Yeah. Thomas Friedman has... Man, that dude is responsible for more human destruction... But <laughs> I'm you, serious because like every, yeah, Thomas Friedman was like one of those guys who's like I'm an expert on the Middle East and the Iraq war is perfectly justified and everyone was like well if Thomas Friedman says it it's, there's it's a, real there's a wonderful Thomas Friedman article oh, generator God. online where you just oh, click random buttons Jesus. and it picks up together an article I but, talked to my cab driver <laughs> And I've learned. Yeah, no, my but, cab driver, Ali. <laughs> but anyway, no, but I also want to stress this on the other side of the coin. The Saudis are regular, normal people, too, who are just going about their jobs, who are just reading whatever news they're getting from this kingdom of Saud. So, like, they're existing within this world, too. And most of them just want to have families. And most of them just want to get on with their lives. And I think this is an important thing to remember, in, especially in a climate when people are like, yeah, okay, now I think Saudi Arabia is bad. Let's bomb the hell out of them and set up a new... You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, like, we need not be too extreme. Like, there's a lot of ways to exist, and most people are just regular people who That's don't true. care about MBS. That's true, but I feel like MBS can manipulate that very easily right. for himself. So, as a listener of Hour of History, you are in a, a, a cultural <laughs> literati. You know, you're, you're, you're <laughs> you... A, you my friend no but you also occupy an important place because when people see mbs you know you might hear in passing conversation oh this mbs looks like he's going to change saudi arabia around you might want to throw a, just a dash of skepticism in there say well you know israeli airlines el al still aren't allowed to fly over the arabian peninsula that's kind of crazy <laughs> like no liberal reformer wouldn't let an airline fly over because they don't think their state should exist that's crazy well, we all know about Israel, Steve. What, is this an MBS line? Sure, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I won't go that far. That would be silly. But I think as well, after now we've pandered to our audience, thank you for being pandered to, um, I would say, like, the problem is, too, if I'm a real, like, if I'm trying to, like, be apologetic for the American foreign policy establishment, right, that's, like, supporting MBS, I'm playing devil's advocate against my own opinion here. Who else? Who who else are you? It's a ghost, but who who are you gonna call? Who else are you gonna support? Right? There really is nobody. Right? There's no other. There are no good options because. Um, well, so then, are you suggesting Donald Trump's "We should just stay out of it" policy is the best? <sighs> even though he isn't following his yeah, own. Even policy. though yeah, that's his stated policy, <laughs> and I actually might have supported him if he that was what he really was doing. No, he's very much involved. I mean, bombings and drone strikes have gone up w way that was up. His first, that was his yeah. first international way, visit with way, Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Well, I think, too, it's like because Saudi Arabia represents, like, his, like, vision of paradise. Like, what? You're, like, a rich, ugly... Oil state. Yeah, you're, like, a rich, ugly man like, ruling this hotels. country. Like, you can be... Yeah, with dope hotel. Yeah, like, like this is great. Like, let's put that Trump sign <laughs> You can have America. multiple wives? What? <laughs> Melania. He's like I've been, I've been moving that on Melania. Yeah, he's like, years. like, I, like, what? You don't have to have affairs. When will the Me Too generation hit Saudi Arabia? Oh God, <laughs> Jesus. No man. So I feel like there's just like an almost like just because Trump is just like a dumb rich dude who like thinks Saudi Arabia represents like the pinnacle of like dumb rich awesomeness. Right? I'm sorry, listeners. We digress. Matthias, but anyways, let's close our so, argument here. So so. 
if I was like, anyways, devil's advocate thing, it's like, who else are you going to support? Because right. we all know that Saudi Arabia is like a terrible theocracy and it's really repressive, horrible policies for women. How are you going to change? But also at the same time, you recognize we get oil from them. We also recognize that they do back us and we recognize that they're a buffer state against Iran. And regardless of whatever else I might think about Iran, you know, Iran does sponsor lots of terrorism officially. That's not just like citizens of Iran. It's like the state sponsors it. We know that Iran messes with American foreign policy all the time. You know, Iran has lots of militias and groups in Syria. And we also recognize that there's like no one else that's really nice to support because otherwise we got to deal with Assad, we got to deal with Russia, we got to deal with ISIS, we got to deal with all kinds of crazy states. There's really just no good option. So the idea would be, well, sure, MBS kind of sucks, but he's all we got, and at least he's something. But I guess I would say that that's really easy. If you go down that mindset of at least it's something, you can end up kind of justifying anything. Anything, yeah. anything and anyone, because you can always find something worse in the Middle East that makes that person seem not as bad. The problem, again, yeah, right, like I said, if, if, but if that's your mentality, you're never going to be able to have standards and you're basically like you lose all kind of moral vision in that in that viewpoint. And then you just end up making compromise after compromise, right? And then, which is why the, our policy in the Middle East has all for decades has been so scattershot and so short-sighted because we just always end up bouncing around to different states and figures to support for very short-term ends, Okay, right? Here's where my idealism is going to kick in. When FDR made the agreement with the House of Saud, you know, he had them join the United Nations that Eleanor Roosevelt was involved in getting to push the UN Declaration of Human Rights. We have a document, we have a history of human rights, a history of human rights that's been ignored by sovereign nations and international organizations. Well, we all know what Samuel Moyne thinks about human rights. Sam Moyne, friend of the show, maybe someday. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Moyne, we're coming for you. And yeah, no, but okay, we need to respect human rights. And if we can get to that level, if we can somehow uh, compel or, you know, that to me is a liberal enforcer. And so MBS, his reforms, you know, the getting rid of the police is one step. He has a whole lot of steps to go, and I don't think he's going to make them. That's the skeptic inside of me. But I think... The, it's in the at least Saudi Arabia is facing the right direction, whether it's at, towards Mecca I, or not. I don't know if they're going to face. I just think that he's just another figure in this kind of perpetual hunt for reform that we're always trying to find in the Middle East and progress. Assad, That's the Ass in you. yeah, I mean Assad, right? Bashar, he was seen as a reformer after he came to power. After Hafiz, he was seen as like, oh, he's a Western guy. He's, He's got like a medical Christopher degree. Christopher Hitchens said, if you think bathism is anything like reform, then you are severely misguided. Yeah, <laughs> but then Hitchens also supported the Iraq War. Yeah. Anyway, but he was he was smart on a lot. And things. he also supported the Kurds. He, okay, yeah, well, we're getting too far afield. But, but what Let's I would say, up, what I would say is I think um, MBS is like very representative of a lot of the pathologies of like American perceptions of the Middle East, right? Where we have this like fetish for trying to find reform figures in our short term. We have no long game in the Middle East such that we're always just sort of glomming on to these like figures who seem reform minded. And yet that always ends up shooting us in the face, right? Like first we back Reza Shah in, in, in um, Afghanistan in the 1980s because we think that the Soviets are the worst evil. We support, you know, Arab Muyahideen through Pakistani secret services. And, but, but right, but what I mean is like, MBS is just such a flagrant example of kind of just the inherent stupidity of American foreign policy in the Middle East because we're so short-sighted and we're so focused on like the tiny thing, like the tiny steps that we end up not having any real moral policy. We're always making Faustian bargains and justifying it to ourselves. Well, we this do. Is the no, best no. We let me do. clarify for you. We do have a moral policy. It was written by Thomas Jefferson. Just because we don't follow our moral policy doesn't mean we don't have one. 
Well, that's what I, I'm going to end with, uh, Matthias. We're not in an hour, Steve. We've oh, you got... want to use every one of your minutes, don't you? I do. This is valuable time. No, okay, so then dispute that. We have Thomas Jefferson has given us our guidelines. Why don't we follow them? Because we're stupid. <laughs> so, so we do have a moral guideline, and this is not only in the Middle East. You look at the articles that have been written about North Korea. Oh, Kim Jong Un holding hands with uh, with Moon Jae In. It looks like it's going to be a future of peace. Kim Jong Un was the devil two months ago, and now he's like this this cute guy who's like jumping across the like. What the hell, man? Yeah. Again, I think it's. I think it's just sort of indicative that we just don't have the ability to have long-sighted foreign policy anymore. And I and I really think now, that, have we ever? Maybe not. But I think it's just it's become worse. All right, it's like it's not that we ever had a long-term vision, but we're just getting ever shorter. No. And, I, and I just feel like with MBS, the problem is he can manipulate us so well because, like, under Trump, all you have to do is just be like, Mr. Trump, you're looking great today. And just act like you love Vince McMahon and WrestleMania, and all of a sudden you're seen as like you're seen as like the most progressive human being on the planet, yeah. right? Okay. And I think it's just that as long as people can flatter our our cultural sensibilities of ourselves as important, we will always then end up making Faustian devilish bargains with someone like MBS, who's just demonstrably not a progressive reformer, right? He's centralized power. He's gotten all kinds of money from folks he's tortured people to death he kidnapped the prime minister of lebanon for christ's sake okay and extradited him to lebanon this is something that you and basically like. was about to like be like either you you promise to like play nice with me and keep hezbollah in line or i'm gonna kill you what but, <laughs> but this is but this is something you like to do to me and call me out on this is what do you what else do we do what else are we going to do? Like, we're given a small step here. Well, this is where I would say, this is why I might, my hippie dipper dippiness, communist besides going to come out, is this is why getting renewable energy off the ground is not just a kind of idealistic, like, oh, it would be nice if we weren't polluting the earth type thing, but also, like, it's a national security issue. We need to demonstrably reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. A, because it's horrible for the environment, and if we destroy our environment, we basically destroy ourselves. But B, because we're so also dependent on foreign oil from time to time that it means states like Saudi Arabia can play us like a fiddle, and we kind of have to help assent to their horrible policies. If we had like full energy independence, not just in terms of fossil fuel, but we could like on solar and wind and other kinds of renewable energy, we could literally just wash our hands of Saudi Arabia and basically say, peace we're not going to support you anymore we're not going to sell you billions of weapons we should stop weapon sales to saudi arabia i think that would be good for the world <laughs> but if we had full energy independence what world is that going to be in I, a possible world i hope i mean do you know how many times back and forth continental flies from newark to los angeles per day like, I mean, the amount of oil that we're just crushing for, like, these empty flights is extraordinary. And trust me, Silicon Valley elites, they're going to be like, but but we like to go to Vegas, man. Man. And then, they're, then not gonna, some, they're not going to walk to Vegas. And, well, we could build trains. We could build... That. Well, I'm okay, so I voted for a train in high school in California. Ah, that you has... always are talking about this damn high. Well, that's because that's, that's indicative of corrupt politics in California. And and I pointed out in our Nixon episode that this all started when Schwarzenegger rose and he said, you know, I'm going to speak for the masses. And then he destroyed the opposition in California politics as a shell of what it was. I don't know. I just think that we have to somehow reduce our dependence on Saudi Arabia's oil, right? Because that's the whole, that's what clinches this whole issue is Mideast oil, the money they get from their oil, and the money that people in Saudi Arabia get from the oil has allowed them to fund Islamic, and it, sorry, rogue beer can, has allowed us to fund Islamic, has allowed them to fund Islamic terrorism. So the thing is, how do you reduce that? You need to reduce the money. And how do you reduce the money? You reduce the importance of oil to the global energy market. Ergo, you got to start creating renewable energy solutions or alternatives. Now I know you can sit there and be cynical all day and be like, well, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Fine. But I would rather strive for a kind of energy structure 
that can at least try and mitigate some of these harsh effects. Otherwise, we're just going to continue to make these devil's bargains with someone like MBS, who is just demonstrably terrible, like an ogre of a human being, you know? And if he gets into power, I mean, he's in power, but if he becomes king, he's 32. The dude is going to be king of Saudi Arabia for life. If the world lasts that long. If, yeah, if the, yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, so... Th- don't, I, don't believe the hype on our boy from the Mideast is what I'm trying to say. All right, well, uh, it's fine, whatever you believe, but thanks for listening to... Our, no, there are bad beliefs out there. Hour of history, it's our place. If you support the Boston Celtics, you are scum. Our world, anytime, any place. Andrew Cuomo.